Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to be working with the Deuteronomistic history, moving from the entrance to the Promised Land to the exile. Let's go ahead and get started. So when we're looking at the Deuteronomistic history, we're looking at certain texts. These are among the prophets in the Hebrew Bible, but they're called the historical books in the Christian Old Testament canon. These are the books that refer to Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings. Ruth is not amongst these in the Hebrew Bible, but is actually held until the end in the writings in the Hebrew Bible canon. But she's placed here chronologically between Judges and 1st Samuel in the Christian Old Testament. The name the New Mystic History comes from the similarities to the Book of Deuteronomy in its ideology and how it's written, um, and even its theology. So how exactly did this come to be? Martin Note, an Old Testament scholar in Germany who actually helped to fight the Nazi propaganda, uh, fight against the Nazis in the 1940s, was the first Old Testament scholar to really delimit uh, these books as a group. Why did he focus on these books as a group? Basically because of the consistency um, and the symmetry in all of them. He looked at them and saw that the stories and themes had a, a lot of symmetry, a lot of consistency as he went along. There were also similar ideas, not only an ideology, but a political ideology. Similar phrases, you could even say uh, bumper sticker taglines, uh, went throughout the Deuteronomistic history, in particular on the emphasis of the monarchy. Uh, the breaking co the covenant will lead to exile and destruction, even at times when the exile was not in focus. And then also the terms, the language, um, and the central theological ideas that were found in Deuteronomy, such as God having a loving relationship with Israel, God having a marriage with Israel. These are descriptions of the covenant that aren't found elsewhere in the Torah, but explicitly in Deuteronomy, and these ideas are the ones that carry forward in these books from Joshua to 2 Kings. So who wrote these? Might very well have two different sets of editors, maybe more than two. It could have come from the same school or party. These are terms that we use in scholarship. Basically, the same group might have focused on these, um, possibly from the Levite tradition, or something like what developed D in the D tradition under Deuteronomy. Um, what were the layers? Maybe two or three different ones. You have this very old set of speeches uh, that appears to exist in Deuteronomy 5 to 26, which is very oral in its origin. Um, maybe that came from the north uh, before the fall of the north and was brought into the south by refugees whenever Assyria came in to destroy the north. Uh, then some people refer to DTR1, uh, which was possibly written around the time of Josiah. And this would be the bulk of the material, uh, folklore and other early works from David and so forth, we pulled together to basically build a bridging history from entering the the Promised Land to the time of King Josiah. And then you have DTR2, which is after Josiah and at the time of the exile, you now have this uh, recollection and this pulling together of the whole project. So what exactly do we have in this system? What are we looking at amongst these six books? And what we have is uh, Joshua telling the story of the conquest, entering the Promised Land. Um, after the Exodus and coming into the Promised Land in Palestine. And then you have this bridge moment. The Book of Judges basically says that uh, presents the story of the Israelite tribes as a confederacy without a king and presents the judges as a dystopic time where uh, the judges would come up and they would rise up when they were needed, but there was no consistency, there was no king. And so the Book of First Samuel shows the rise of the king, um, moving from the, from the judge and prophet Samuel to Saul, the first king. That reign ends tragically, but David ascends, and his reign and the reign of Solomon are seen as one of the one of the largest chunks of this history, but also seen as a golden age. After the death of Solomon, you have the kingdom split. The north secedes, and the south becomes its own entity. Uh, each of them become their own. The north becomes known as Israel. The ten tribes of Israel uh, recede to the north, and then Judah and Benjamin remain the kingdom of Judah. 
The next major section, which takes up almost an entire book, um, would be Elijah and Elisha, uh, who preach in the north before the destruction. But it's not enough. The north will fall, Assyria will come in and destroy them for not keeping the covenant. And then the next major circuit would be Josiah's reign. And this seems to be, if we're looking at DTR1, this is the goal or the climax of the entire function. Josiah's um, reform, his religious reform of the temple, seems to be the, the climax and the reform of not only uh, the religious situation, but of the entire kingdom's history in a lot of ways. But the story doesn't work out that way entirely in history. Josiah dies a young death, uh, fighting on behalf of Assyria, and then in the long run, uh, Josiah will end up losing, uh, or sorry, the south will end up being destroyed by Babylon. So what exactly do we see in Joshua? The first thing that we have is Joshua presents the story of a conquest. Uh, the problem with that, though, is that the historical and archaeological evidence that we have and that we found in Palestine don't line up well with what Joshua wants to describe. And this has been a problem uh, for, number, for a number of uh, decades. Um, so as far as what exactly happened in, uh, in the rise of Israel, some individuals take the book of Joshua at face value and say this is exactly what happened. Uh, we're very close to what happened and that those are individuals that feel that this was a singular military conquest of Palestine as it's described in Joshua. Another possibility uh, we find in Judges chapters 2 to 3 is the possibility of a peaceful immigration. And this was put forward by a German scholar named Alt uh, who felt that Judges 2 to 3 actually gave them more plausible idea that the Israelites after the Exodus moved in slowly uh, in immigration patterns into Palestine and then over time developed their own culture. The minimalist theory uh, puts aside the entire concept of the Exodus and basically says the Israelites are Canaanites. They were here for a long time um, and they just ended up developing their own religious identity, is isolating themselves from other Canaanites and then ended up creating their own storyline. They were Israelites, not Canaanites. That's one possibility. The, another possibility brought up by Norman Gottwald in the 1970s was the concept of a peasant revolt. You had Canaanites who were, who were being, Canaanite peasants who were being uh, mistreated by their Canaanite overlords, and then you have the Israelites bring in uh, the god of freedom, the god of liberation from Exodus, and the Israelites team up with these peasants, and they all end up rebelling um, against the Canaanite overlords. So those are some of the major theories that have developed to this point. Uh, right now, a lot of emphasis uh, leans towards the peaceful immigration model as being the most likely. That's the one the historical and the archaeological evidence tends to benefit. And in particular, this goes along with the socioeconomic uh, trajectory of that time. The uh, developments in agriculture made it possible to move in at that time, and the populations would grow slowly but, uh, but measuredly along the way. This is a boring theory, um, but sometimes those are the most historically accurate as well. The military option creates many theological problems, uh, in particular with the concept of holy war and the war of annihilation. Uh, whenever you are presenting the annihilation of an entire civilian population as a type of holy war and as a type of ransom for uh, and divinely sanctioned ransom, you are creating a number of problems theologically for ethical uh, disputes about war and it remains a major issue uh, for Jewish and Christian uh, traditions today of what to do about the lessons of Joshua. The book of Judges, the whole idea here is to present the dystopic reality for the Israelites between entering the land and having a kingdom. As a confederacy of tribes, they don't work. That's basically what the book of Judges wants to get across. The Israelites need a monarchy to survive. Um, and in this case, what ends up happening is if social order can lead to religious order, 
then social disorder can create religious disorder and vice versa. Um, you have this devolving uh, spiral staircase um, in judges where things keep getting worse and with each new cycle of violence you have the new leader that rises up being less moral, less appropriate, um, and less heroic than the one that came before all to the point where it comes to a head in chapters 18 to 22, where it seems as if all of civilization is imploding on itself in a situation of terror and horror. Um, and this is one of the challenges of this entire book. It looks not only at uh, the pain of human emptiness, but also at what worshiping power and worshiping one's own um, one's own need and desire for power ends up creating in social destruction and uh, the destruction of relationships between people. There's also this concept that, that comes forth in Judges that we become what we worship. Idolatry leads the Israelites to become as heartless as their stone idols and to treat one another like objects. And that is exactly what the Book of Judges is trying to say they should on the one hand, it's showing how horrible it can get, and in showing how horrible it can get is saying this is not what the covenant has called us to be. Which brings us to 1 Samuel. Um, there are a number of different traditions in the book of 1 Samuel that describe how the kingship comes to be. Um, one trajectory shows it as being uh, Saul is a humble leader, whose rise to the kingship is exactly what God wants. And in another example, uh, the, king, the kingship itself is decried as, uh, as a horrible insult to God and a major uh, challenge to human freedom. Um, so there's this remarkable uh, inclusion of two ideas about what a king is. And in the parable in Judges 9, uh, you see this concept as well. A king is a good idea if you want centralization of authority. But what happens if that king is a scumbag? What do you do then? And that is one of the paradoxes, or the par um, yeah, one of the paradoxes that the, book, the books of the Deuteronomistic history try to present. What do you do with a king when he's a terrible king? Samuel is going to be a prophet who's going to be in conflict with Saul over the boundaries of their job descriptions. And Saul's dynasty is going to end, and David's uh, dynasty is going to rise and be on the ascendancy. How exactly does David come into power? It's a bit problematic. David was Saul's uh, right-hand man. He was his top general who leaves um, Saul's uh, patronage and goes and works for the enemy with the Philistines um, until Saul is killed. And then David comes back to Israel and ends up taking uh, control and consolidating the kingdoms together, or consolidating the tribes together to have a single kingdom. In a lot of situations, that would look and sound like a political coup, um, a regime change of sorts. So. One of the things that the text tries to do is to make very clear, that's not what happened here. Everyone wants to make clear David left Saul, not because he had political aspirations, but because Saul was trying to kill him. That David had multiple opportunities to kill Saul, but did not. That David had a great love for Saul's son, Jonathan, would never want anything wrong or bad to happen to him. And that David did not pursue the kingship, the kingship instead pursued David and that he was, had been anointed by God at a young age to be king, to replace Saul, and it was only a matter of time and was completely within God's will for him to do this. And the story has to work hard to do that, because otherwise, on its surface, the story of David's rise to power looks very, very, well, problematic. And that leads us to this point at the end of part one of this presentation.